Will the members and our guests please take their seats? This meeting will now come to order. As all members have received a copy of the call for tonight's meeting, the reading of the call will be omitted. Will everyone please rise and join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. As all members have received a copy of the proposed minutes of our January 20 meeting, the reading of those minutes will be omitted. Do we have any suggested changes to those minutes? Hearing none and absent objection, the minutes as submitted stand adopted upon unanimous consent. Dr. Carl Carlson of District 1. Mr. Moderator, fellow members of the RTM, uh, my friend Hans Helbig passed away uh, last month. He was a member of this organization for many years. Uh, at one point he retired from the RTM, but I prevailed on him to come back because we didn't have quite a number of members uh, for the voters uh, uh, to act upon. And he understood the problems of democracy and the need uh, for a full delegation. So he indulged me, but there were problems. He had problems uh, driving at night. Uh, he did the best uh, he could uh, in old age to help us out. Uh, he was a man who had a great deal of optimism for the town of Greenwich. He was also quite critical of its politicians. Some of his criticisms were certainly well-founded. Uh, but Greenwich was something very, very uh, special uh, for him. And he worked uh, largely in writing articles to newspapers to try to make it better. This was his understanding that Greenwich could be a much better place than it was and government could work better. Uh, he tried very hard in this. Uh, he had a, so much conscience that he could have been a conscience for the whole uh, town. Uh, uh, there are many uh, reminiscences that I could bring about uh, Hans. I think the most poignant was when I came to him with my condolences for the passing of his step-granddaughter. Just the mention of her name, and she's memorialized out in the courtyard here, brought very uh, sharp tears uh, from his eyes. Uh, Hans Helbig was a very humane man and a very well-meaning man, and I hope that we all remember him as such. Thank you. Our first selectman, Peter Tessie. Good evening, Mr. Moderator and ladies and gentlemen of the RTM. As of now, a 2009-10 fiscal year budget has been recommended by the Budget Committee of the Board of Estimate and Taxation to the full board. <clears throat> the budget currently reflects a proposed 3.55 mill rate increase. Arriving at this level of increase in these economic times with declining revenues was difficult and required everyone involved to think anew about our expectations for town government. BET Budget Committee member Larry Simon summarized the efforts to date as follows. Everybody acted in a responsible way to bring this difficult budget together. The next phase of this lengthy process takes place next week with the full BET holding a public hearing and recommending a budget to all of you. 
I encourage all of you to attend March 17th at 7 p.m. and make your voices heard. I am continuing to manage this year's budget and planning for the next two. This evening, you are being asked to consider and approve a retirement incentive, one of several measures the town is employing to deal with the current economic situation. In addition to non-salaried budget reductions employed in the current fiscal year, elimination of certain vacant positions, the reduction in force, the town is currently in negotiations with its bargaining unit seeking a wage freeze for 7109 and migrating employees to a less cost costly health care package. These measures are all necessary in order to contain costs and live within our means. If we are able to con obtain collective bargaining unit approval for these measures and revenues do not decline further, we will meet our proposed obligations in 910. However, if the revenues decline further, then we will have to consider further personnel reductions. We know 1011 will be more difficult as our um, pension obligation will increase as a result of the precipitous drop in the stock market. As matters develop, I will keep you all apprised because in the end, we all have the good of the town at heart. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen Walco, Chairman of the BET. Uh, good evening, Mr. Moderator, members of the RTM. As the town of Greenwich continues to deliberate on the current fiscal year 2009-10 budget, it has become very apparent to all of us that we have entered into uncharted waters that have come to challenge us to a degree that has never been witnessed before. The first selectmen and the BET have been presented with the task of forwarding a budget that has been severely impacted by a country embroiled in a financial crisis that affects us all. It is no secret to anyone that when you turn on your television or pick up your newspaper that the financial news has been bad and continues to get worse. The negative existing financial conditions have presented us with a challenge in crafting a balanced budget that stays within the long-standing BET guidelines. The problems we are facing are twofold. First and foremost, the fallout from the country's financial downturn has created a revenue budgetary shortfall that needs to be filled through either a cutback in expenditures, a raising of taxes, or a combination of both. This problem has been addressed by a reduction in headcount through layoffs with an associated savings and fringe benefits. Of course, town departments and the Board of Education clearly recognize the need to contribute and have stepped up to the challenge by curtailing expenses. After the BET approves the fiscal year 10 budget next week, I can almost assure you that you will be presented with a budget that conforms to BET guidelines for a 10th year in a row. As you are aware, the BET tried something new this year. We attended your March district meetings to listen to your concerns. The town's pension fund was discussed by almost every district. The future funding of the pension fund is the second problem that looms and outweighs, quite frankly, the revenue shortfall. That is why I'm before you tonight. In the fiscal year 11 budget, we will face a bigger challenge than the one we are addressing this year. We have a pension fund that has been seriously eroded by the negative investment returns created by the national and global financial crisis. The town of Greenwich charter requires that our annual pension contribution be fully funded as detailed in our actual annual valuations. Fortunately, this number, or unfortunately, this number will increase dramatically. The increase will be of such a nature that it will stress future budgets more than the current one impacted by our revenue shortfalls. As recently as July 1, 2003, the pension fund had a funded ratio of assets to liabilities of 127%. Unfortunately, as the liabilities of the plan continued to grow, the market value of the assets did not keep pace. As of July 1, 2008, this funded ratio was reduced to 98.2%. In the fourth quarter of 2008, the pension fund portfolio had a loss of 12.1%, ranking us in the 93rd percentile. Not excellent, but equally not an indicator, and I repeat, not an indicator, that our pension fund has been mismanaged in any way. In addition to the annual increases in the liabilities of the plan, the pension plan has been beset with a diminution of assets not seen since the dot-com bubble burst in 2001-03. This is not only a town of Greenwich problem, it is a problem for every pension plan. 
As of Jul October 31st, 2007, the Retirement Pension Fund had a market valuation of assets amounting to $361 million. As of January 31st, 2009, the market valuation decreased by $117 million to $244.8 million. Each year, the town hires an actuary to perform a valuation of the plan as required by town charter. There are variables contained within each report that impact the annual required contribution, such as demographics, cost of payroll, plan changes, and investment experience. These variables, which have a positive or negative impact individually, help determine the need for the town to provide a contribution each year. For example, the town contribution for fiscal year 09 was 6.6 .6 million. For fiscal year 10 budget coming to you in May, the amount will increase to 7.2 million. It is at this point that I need to point out to all of you here tonight the impact of the investment experience variable and how serious it will become as we embark on the ensuing budget for fiscal year 2010-2011. The retirement board meets monthly to address these concerns and has already taken several steps to mitigate the effects of the global economic downturn on the pension fund to include one, underperforming investment managers have been terminated and replaced with index funds or new investment managers. Two, during 2008, funds affected by the strengthening U.S. dollar were reduced by over 13 million and the monies were placed in interest-bearing short-term investment accounts to maintain value. Three, administrative expenses have been reduced by 22% due to a reduction in management fees pursuant to the changes that I just mentioned. And four, the Retirement Board continues to research for attractive investment alternatives as they present themselves in these challenging mar markets. I cannot tell you with precision how well we will end up through June 30th of this year regarding the market valuation of the pension fund. What I can tell you is that the damage done to date to the retirement fund will have the town presented with a dramatic increase in the required annual contribution that may approximate an increase as much as $10 million or more for fiscal year 10-11. This figure may be higher or lower, but it's too early to tell. Although the BET has addressed the current revenue shortfalls that have impacted the fiscal year 10 budget that will come before you this May, I need to impress upon all of you that our work is not yet done. We are facing future pension contributions that will stress not only next year's budget, but subsequent budgets that follow until the economy has rebounded to a sufficient level to relieve both the revenue shortfalls and the pension funding requirements. To that end, wage freezes, layoffs, new and less costly health care options are all part of a plan to achieve this savings of 10 to $12 million between now and the end of fiscal year 11. I cannot underscore the importance of addressing the anticipated shortfall for fiscal year 11 now. The BET and the first selectmen recognize this problem and now you have been fully apprised of the magnitude of not only this year's budgetary dilemma, but also future budgets as they present themselves each year. To date, the BET and the first selectmen have been able to handle the initial challenges. I have total confidence that the, you, the RTM, will recognize the seriousness of this issue before us today and into the future. Together, we can all get through these trying times. Years from now, I believe we will look back at what we have been going through now and relate to all of those who follow us on how we collectively stood up to this hard challenge presenting this, our town's budgets. On a more procedural note, fiscal year 10 budgets will be available starting Friday of this week. In order to save money, if you're able to pick them up at the finance department, I would ask that you go ahead and do so before two o'clock on Friday. They'll be available from about nine to two. If you do not pick up your budget book by two o'clock, we will simply put them in the mail so that you have them before our public hearing on Tuesday, which is March 17th, and then we will be voting on the budget on March 19th. If they're made available beforehand, before Friday, I will email the district chairs and ask the district chairs to send that email to their members, uh, indicating that they're available either Wednesday or Thursday of this week, which is also a possibility. I thank you for the time in presenting this to you, and we look forward to a successful completion of this year's budget process. Thank you. Thank you. 
perhaps some of our districts might arrange a uh, collective effort to pick up budgets and get them to their members to avoid sending out uh, through the mail. Um, I know that that time frame nine to two is not gonna be convenient to a lot of people, but perhaps uh, we can organize some effort to, uh, to get those delivered. All right, Despina Fossiliotis of District 11. Mr. Moderator and uh, fellow RTM members, uh, this is to announce that uh, District 11 is calling a special meeting on Wednesday, um, March 11th, to discuss what we know of uh, the budget. Um, this is uh, because we voiced such concerns over it that we want to look at uh, what we've got available to us a little bit further. But this is the formal announcement to this body that we are holding the special meeting. Thank you. And that's at uh, Nathaniel Witherell? At what time? At 7.30. 7.30, thank you. Jerry Isaacson? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Senator Scott France has asked me to make this announcement that on uh, Tuesday, March 31st at 7 p.m., at the Greenwich Library, the main branch, uh, there will be a, uh, a meeting to discuss the state of Connecticut budget. Uh, the host for it will be Senator France and Representatives uh, Gibbons, Florin, and Camillo. That's Tuesday, March 31st, 7 p.m., Greenwich Library, State of Connecticut Budget Forum. Thank you. Thank you. And also <coughs> on March 31st, I have scheduled a meeting of our moderators committee for the district and committee chairs. That will be at town hall. We'll get word out on what room that'll be and the time will be eight o'clock. That now brings us to tonight's call and pursuant to a notice that I sent to our district and committee chairs, it is my intention based on the reports received from our districts to place on our consent calendar four items items one, two, four, and five, which would leave items three and six to be considered separately. So at this time, uh, and any item that remains on our consent calendar will be voted upon without hearing any committee reports or uh, debate on the items. So I will now place the following four items on our consent calendar. Item number one is the appointment of Stefan Scoofalus as a regular member of the Inland Wetlands and Water Courses, one word, agency, uh, for a term expiring March 31, 2013. Item two is the appointment of Lloyd Hull to be a regular member of the Historic District Commission for a term expiring for a term beginning April 1, 2009 and expiring March 31, 2014. Item four is the acceptance of a grant of $22,500 to be used to purchase uh, TV equipment to be installed in the cone room for purposes of Channel 79. And this might be an appropriate time to thank our Channel 79 volunteers here tonight, Paul Curtis and Dr. Evan Delman. <laughs> and the last item to be placed on the consent calendar is the acceptance of $85,000 from the Havemeyer Trust for purposes of uh, improvements to the Havemeyer building. Is there any objection to the placement of any of those items on our consent calendar? Hearing none and absent objection, will the district chairs please mark your voting cards. Consent calendar items one, two, four, and five, and proceed to poll your delegation. Item three, 
now comes before us. May we have the resolution on that item? Frank Mazza, Chairman of the Hamilton Avenue School Building Committee. Mr. Moderator, members of the RTM, revolved that the sum of 200,000 be and is hereby appropriated to be added to a capital account number Z 6801792 Five nine five five zero two five one one zero, known as Hamilton Avenue School Reconstruction. Said appropriation come to come from the capital and non-recurring fund. Thank you. Will the member please move the adoption of the resolution? The resolution on item three has been moved and seconded. May we hear the reports of the committees that considered this item, beginning with Bob Brady, chairman of our education committee. Good evening, Mr. Moderator, uh, me fellow members and guests. The Education Committee met last Monday evening uh, to consider this item. Uh, it is a $200,000 appropriation to the Hamilton Avenue Building Committee. Mr. Mazza presented the item. Continue. The building was not completed by Thanksgiving as had been planned uh, when the Building Committee was last before us. As listed in the explanos, this money is to cover the costs of the four months of uh, December through March this year for the architect and project manager fees, uh, the utilities which Worth, the uh, contractor, has refused to pay, and the cost of retrofitting the chimney flues. Uh, the money is planned to be sufficient to complete the job. The building is now under the control of and being used and operated by the Board of Ed. Frank said that he believed that there would likely be claims and counterclaims by both the town and Worth. The town's lawyers are in charge of those aspects of the project. The committee voted 10-01 to recommend uh, District 2 abstaining uh, because of uh, just uncertainties on this. Uh, I do hope that uh, after all of this, Frank will be able to forget the account number. Uh, I understand that it's sometime heard in the late night sleep, uh, the, the Mazza household. Thank you. Thank you. Pamela Frederick, Chair of our Finance Committee. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Moderator, uh, fellow members and guests. This item was presented to the Finance Committee um, last Monday. Uh, the items, uh, the cost, uh, were listed by Bob Bra Brady. The funds um, will be used uh, to supplement an additional 278,000 that remain in the budget and um, the additional 225,000 for these additional for additional costs that haven't been uh, yet committed. Many, uh, many are aware of the multitude of delays, errors, and disputes associated with completing this project. There's likely to be a protracted dispute resolution process and potentially lawsuits to settle associated claims. Um, we were informed that this is the final appropriation, and fortunately we've heard that a couple times before, so hopefully this is actually it. Um, but it's not likely the last we'll hear of this project. I think it will uh, go on for quite a while. The committee uh, voted in favor of this item, 11-1-0, uh, with the one descending vote opposed to paying the uh, contractor any additional money when it is likely that the contractor will owe the town a sizable amount of money. Again, our vote was 11-1-0. Thank you. David Mellick, Chair of our Public Works Committee. Thank you. Um, on uh, Monday, March 2nd, we met at Town Hall. A uh, little note, as you recall, it was about 20 degrees, we had uh, quite a bit of snow, and it was about blowing at least 20 miles an hour, and we still had pretty good attendance, uh, so thanks for those who are getting out. Um, anyway, we, we reviewed um, item three and five, which has already been disposed of. Uh, this request is for 200,000, as previously discussed. Frank Mazza was uh, in attendance uh, to present and uh, very cooperatively fielded questions from from the committee. Uh, the explanos do a good job at itemizing the request. And the request is primarily to cover the extended time, however, it has taken again to finish the school and the resulting professional oversight and overhead costs. Um, just a quick, quick little aside. Hey, the kids are in the school. Thank goodness. So, I mean, that's, that's something that really, we really uh, should keep in, in, in mind. 
Uh, one enlightening example uh, about this request was the contractor's refusal to pay the utility costs for the school prior to occupancy, even though it was a spe specific contractual obligation. Um, since it was the contractor who claims that it was others who caused the delay, um, they just flat, flat out refused to pay the bills. Um, since a utility cutoff uh, wouldn't be acceptable, um, we of course had to do and do the right thing, and we did it. And we paid the bill, and now this is all also on the long dispute list. A large part of the the latest delay was due to the installation of the flue gas, <coughs> the uh, improper gas flue for the boiler. It was galvanized steel rather than stainless steel. Uh, this was an expensive and time-consuming uh, repair. Why it occurred um, will need to be established, but the work was done. The funds are needed now regardless who is at fault. In addition, there are two specific items, uh, new items, uh, that are part of this request. The first is for an attic ventilation fan. Uh, required by the building department in the old building. Uh, and the second item is for reseeding the grounds in case the uh, fall plantings don't stick. Um, a strategically uh, an important part is that this gets us our full certificate of occupancy, or that is the absolute intention. Um, and that relates to the kids being in the building and unfettered and so forth. Uh, Frank made it clear that he can't guarantee that there won't be an additional request. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it, it, it all depends on how many disputes get settled, either by negotiation or through appropriate legal actions. And this, this kind of gets into the big picture here. We all have some perspectives on the reasons for the delays in the project. We also have views on the costs. For the most part, however, these perspectives are really only built on hearsay, whether from our own conversations, our observations, whether they're casual or not, or what we read in the papers. We need to remember that really only a few people really know the underlying facts and conditions. This will be fodder for the lawyers, insurers, and bond companies and town council. There are specific contracts in place and the remedies uh, to all of the dispute between these parties need to take their course. And this will take time, a lot of time. Since the school is mostly, uh, most importantly, as mentioned, now occupied, we need to begin to review the, re uh, re the review and recovery process. Uh, the proposed review committee uh, to be established will get us full accounting, but they may not necessarily correlate with the costs we incur. We voted 900 districts two, four, and six absent. Thank you. Thank you. Discussion on item three. Jim Boutel, District 8. Mr. Moderator, fellow members, Mr. Moderator, just through you to the appropriate town official, um, and maybe for the benefit of some of our newer members, when we began this process, the Board of Ed turns over the building, control of the building to the school building committee. The school building committee, in the case of this project, in turn, turned it over to the contractor. At what point in this process did the contractor turn control of the building back over to the building committee? And now that we have kids in there, at what point does the building committee turn the building back over to the Board of Ed? Um, I raise that question because one of the points that was just made was this may not be our last appropriation request from this building committee. I can tell this building committee it will be my last positive vote for appropriations for this project. Um, and you really, really mean it this time. Yes, <laughs> just like they do, Mr. Moderator. But I'm just wondering, are, do, is the building now back in the possession of the Board of Ed? Mr. Mazza. February 6th. All right, so the building committee turned over the building to the Board of Ed on February 6th. Now, Mr. Boutel made a statement, and <clears throat> I'd just like to clarify if that is accurate. During the construction project, does the building committee actually turn over the building to the contractor? No. Okay, it's the building committee's responsibility until it turns it back over. Okay, thank you. Yes, Mr. Boutel. Yes, 
Well, I know that's what you said, and that's what I'm trying to clarify. Um, either Mr. Mazza or Mr. Fox, if someone could clarify that. We do not turn over the building to the contractor. We turn over the means and method of construction to the contractor. So we award a contract to a contractor, and then it is up to him to build the building as the terms are used, means and methods. He devises the methods and the way the building is to be built, and we just uh, administer the contract. He's had a little uh, nightmare there that if we turned it over to them, they might have put a mortgage on it. <laughs> Further discussion on item three, Dr. Carlson. Mr. Moderator, members of the RTM, this project, in my opinion, has been very irregular, very unusual for a long time now, and I've lost my confidence in the people handling it. I suggest that you vote no or abstain on this proposal tonight. Don't spend any more money on this until you have full resolution of all claims. I think that it's the best, honest way of handling this. Further discussion on item three. Will the district chairs please mark your voting cards, item number three, and proceed to poll your delegation. I have the results of the vote on the consent calendar items. Those were items one, two, four, and five. Those in favor, 183. Opposed, zero. Abstaining, zero. Those items have carried. Now, before we get to the last of the agenda items, um, let me remind you, I think everyone is aware, that this is one of those peculiar times when we may, in fact, have more non-agenda items than agenda items to deal with. I hope everyone is, in fact, aware uh, that the Land Use Committee is proposing to bring us a resolution that was not on our agenda. District 1 is planning to bring us a resolution that was not on our agenda. And the Transportation Committee may or may not bring us an item that is not on our agenda. Uh, and as we uh, look to the point uh, later in the evening when we get to those matters, everyone should be aware that under the Freedom of Information Act, because this is a regular meeting, we can take up non-agenda items, but we must first vote by a two-thirds majority of those present and voting to do so. And uh, the motion to take up a non-agenda item will be non-debatable, as we saw in December with the District 10 since the meeting resolution that they sought to uh, put before us. So that is to come. We only have one, one more agenda item to dispose of, and that is item six, and that now comes before us. Al Kaba, Director of Labor Relations. Mr. Moderator, members town meeting, good evening. We have a substitute resolution, item for item number six, resolved that in accordance with section 747 of the Connecticut General Statutes, the representative town meeting of the town of Greenwich hereby approves the terms of the following collectively bargained agreements which were in conflict with any charter provisions, special act, ordinance, rule, or regulation of the town, the agreements between the town and the Greenwich Municipal Employees Association, Teamsters Local 456, Wyuna Local 136, and AFSCME Local 1303-222, which agreements provide for a retirement center program for town employees in the bargaining units represented by said unions. 
Further resolved that the representative town meeting of the town of Greenwich authorizes the controller of the town of Greenwich to direct the trustee of the other post employment benefits fund, trust fund, OPEP trust, to make payments from the OPEP trust to fund the retiree medical credits set forth in the collectively bargained agreements between the town and the Greenwich Municipal Employees Association, Teamsters Local 456, Layuna Local 136, and AFSCME Local 1303-222, which agreements provide for a retirement incentive program for town employees and the bargaining units represented by said unions, and to fund such retiree medical credits as may be adopted by the Board of Selectmen to provide a retirement incentive for managed MNC employees who are eligible to retire with conditions comparable to those in the collectively bargained agreements. Will a member please move the adoption of the substitute resolution? The substitute resolution on item six has been moved and seconded. Now, has everyone received a copy of this substitute resolution? Is there a need to read it again? No? If there is, we will read it again. I don't hear anyone, so we won't. All right, that is now before us. <clears throat> We will now take up the committee reports on the substitute resolution. Joan Caldwell, Chairman of our Labor Contracts Committee. Mr. Moderator, members in town meeting. The last item on our call this evening, as has been indicated, is a request for the RTM to amend the town's retirement program. The substitute resolution which you have before you really says nothing more than the, than the proposed amendment says. And it has been rewritten and you have it in substitute form because we wanted to make the language exactly comply with the language of the state statute which governs, governs all of our actions. So there is nothing there to be concerned about. Um, what we are doing is not offering an early retirement, but a retirement incentive. We have many employees in this town who are eligible to retire right now, but for one reason or another have chosen not to. In view of the economic climate, it's not hard to understand why they might defer retirement for a year or two and kind of try and ride out the, the storm. However, the town feels that it might benefit from the retirement of some of our employees, and so we have elected to offer an incentive. We are offering it for a very short period of time. This window is open until June 30th, and that's it. The people eligible in the town to retire must be, must be eligible by virtue of their having attained the age of 65 or reaching the rule of 80, which is a combination of the years you've worked for the town plus your calendar years. For those who have reached retirement, that is the age of 65 or the rule of 80, and who have also worked for the town 33 and a third years, we are offering the following incentive. We are increasing the multiplier, the amount of money by which you amend or you buy against your last or best year's salary from 66 and two thirds percent, which is currently in effect, to 72 and a third percent. In dollars and cents, it adds up to a fairly significant amount if you were retired. In addition, the town has said, because we know that many people, or we suspect that many people who are eligible to retire and have elected not to are, are making that decision because they're concerned about health insurance, and you know that that's growing rapidly, the town will help you pay your health insurance for the first five years of your retirement. We will help you to the extent that in the first year, the town will pay 85% of your medical premium, the employee will pay 15. In the second year of your retirement under this system, under this early incentive program, the employee pays 75%, the town 25%. In the third year, it's 50-50. In the fourth year, the pendulum begins to swing. The town pays 25, the employee 50% or 75%, and in the fifth year, the employee picks up the, the complete cost as he would if we didn't make this offer. 
Now the Labor Contracts Committee looked at this very, very carefully. Initially, I don't think we were all in favor of it. But as we looked further, we felt that much of the cost for this is pushed into the, inset into the retirement program, into the pension fund, which means that we have years to pay for it. What it does do is it helps us immediately with our operating expenses, and they're the ones that we are most anxious to get under control. If we get a group of people who retire under this program, it is the hope of the administration, and certainly the Labor Contracts Committee said it loud and clear to both Mr. Kava and to the first selectman, we want as few of these jobs filled as possible. There are some that we will have to fill because they are a necessity. But where we are filling jobs, we will be filling them at a lesser salary. We will be filling them with employees who will be coming into the new town pension program, which is to find contribution, not to find benefits. Remember, we've got all of our employment, employees, new employees under defined contribution. And if new hires happen to be either non-represented employees or members of LIUNA, we also will get them into the health savings program, which is another uh, savings for the town. All in all, Mr. Kava calculated, he said, on the health insurance alone, if an employee who retires under this incentive program is not yet Medicare age, we will save $21,000. If the retiree is Medicare aid, we will save $45,000. That's a fairly hefty price tag. We felt that in the long term, since this is a very limited group of people we're making the offering to and the window of opportunity is short, it was a program that should be accepted. And we voted five in favor, none opposed, and recommend it to you for your approval. Thank you. Pamela Frederick with the Finance Committee report. Okay, uh, Mr. Moderator, good evening, um, members and guests. The item was presented to the Finance Committee by uh, Al Cava. Uh, Larry Simon uh, attended our meeting and also provided additional insights. Uh, the item is proposed and summarized for us earlier by First Selectman Peter Tessie, um, and it involves the uh, temporary amendment of the Charter Section 181A2. Uh, the program is being offered to current employees, and I'll ask for clarification um, through the moderator to uh, Mr. Kava, the filing date by which uh, uh, employees would have to file for retirement. We were told at our meeting that it was July 31st, and uh, Jones' report says June 30th, so we might want to clarify that to ensure that the employees, if they're here this evening or uh, look at this, uh, they have a, a clear uh, record of, of which date they need to file by. At any rate, they would need to retire by September 1st, 2009. And again, if that's not correct, if you could confirm. Um, the, the benefits were described by Joan. Um, each bargaining unit can independently approve participation of its members, uh, meaning one unit could decide, could vote against it, but the other units con could continue to um, uh, vote in favor and participate. All units except police and fire are eligible. The town is providing these benefits to induce increased retirement of higher cost employees. Either the positions will be eliminated or replaced with lower cost employees. Um, and that would be via lower salaries as they will be less experienced and uh, lower benefit cost um, as was described uh, earlier. The savings are dependent on the number of participants, um, their profile, and these savings will be offset in part or in full by increased uh, benefits that are being provided to the employees. Again, it's a timing difference between uh, the savings now and the operating budget over the next few years versus spreading that out over the uh, retirement, um, anticipated retirement uh, period for the employee. 
particular points, some of the key discussion points in the Finance Committee include included um, concern that this um, being solely a voluntary uh, program with the potential to lose a, a fairly sizable portion of experience base of em employees um, and without the town um, and the first selectman having the ability to deny participation for uh, certain employees that we might deem um, necessary to, to retain. Um, the, there was also confirmation that any employee that participates cannot double dip, if you will, since reemployment would mean they'd have a loss of uh, retirement uh, benefits until they subsequently retired um, permanently. Uh, we also confirmed that of the recently laid off employees, only one uh, was eligible to participate in this and uh, would be offered um, such participation in, in the incentive. And um, we also uh, had a recommendation to ensure that the, in, the employees are aware that there's no intention to offer any other incentive. And as Joan highlighted, it's a short period by which you could participate. Um, and so to encourage as much participation as possible. Um, finally, um, while, the, while we were not given a specific schedule of savings, um, we were supportive of the goals and intent uh, that this item would be to reduce town costs, to lower the, the cost of payroll, and to reduce, reduce the staffing either um, permanently or replacement with lower cost employees. And this would be done through voluntary retirement. The BET um, representative, Larry uh, Simon, informed us that uh, the, they, oh, they expected um, overall or anticipating a net savings of as much as 20%. We didn't have hard numbers for that, but um, we trust the BET members and we think they've probably done a good job of, of doing a projection and analysis. So on that uh, basis, the Finance Committee voted 12-0-0 in favor. Thank you. Um, before we get to Mr. Brady's report on this item, I have the vote on item three, which was the appropriation of $200,000 for the Hamilton Avenue School Building Project. Those in favor, 145. Opposed, 34. Abstaining, 9. That item is carried. Mr. Brady. Thank you. Uh, good evening again. Uh, the, Art the Education Committee considered this item last Monday night. Again, t uh, 11 districts represented, uh, District 10 not, not represented. <coughs> Excuse me. Mr. Kava presented this item with Larry Simon's assistance. Because the resolution's language purported to temporarily amend the charter, it raised questions as to whether it was in legal order. We focused our attention on the, the business deal component of it and asked Mr. Kava to uh, go back, consult with uh, uh, town council uh, as to whether the language of the uh, resolution was in fact correct. Uh, they, he came back, I guess it was on Tuesday morning, uh, I spoke to him and he said he and uh, uh, Mr. Fox were working on it. They would change it so that it would be uh, very similar to the language we see when we adopt a labor contract and uh, and waive conflicts with the uh, charter. But we are not, in fact, rep temporarily or otherwise amending the charter with this. Um, the uh, uh, Mr. Cobb also said the window that is open for employees to pick up the deal is between uh, adoption of the resolution, should we adopt it tonight, and July 31, and the papers would be processed out through uh, September 1st, I believe. Um, other than that, Ms. Caldwell and Ms. Frederick have basically described all the numbers, and I'm not going to go through them again uh, unless somebody really wants to hear them. I'll take that as a no. Uh, we voted eight in favor, uh, one opposed, and two abstaining uh, to recommend this. Districts four and eight abstained, wanting to know more details, and a district two is opposed to it due to the uncertainty of the outcome of the deal. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Evan Delman, chairman of our Town Services Committee. Good evening. Town services met with Al Kava last Tuesday, and the other committee chairs have already covered most of my report. I'd like to address two items, though. First was District, District 6's question as to why the amount that will be saved, as told to us Tuesday, differed from the numbers he received the night before at another committee's meeting. Uh, that went unanswered. Secondly, uh, it was asked if the unions would allow pay cuts rather than future layoffs. We were informed that unions work to keep their members happy, 
If someone is laid off, they are no longer in the union. So by not giving back, those members still working stay satisfied. Unions work in a hierarchy. It's based on employment date. Last hired is the first fired. The members have a good idea that if there were future layoffs, whether or not they would be able to maintain their employment using the bump process. This allows them to transfer laterally to a similar job if they have a longer time and grade than the person they are bumping. Only those at the bottom of the employment chain would be cut and keeping the top half fully salaried and happy. Our vote was 10-01. The one abstention didn't want to vote no, but didn't want to vote yes either. Thank you. All right, we did have a question raised by our finance committee. Uh, perhaps Mr. Cabo or anyone else able to respond. Yes, employees would have to file an application by June 30 in order to be retire. They can retire um, through to September 1st. Thank you. Discussion on item six, Michael Wasick, District 11. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and good evening, members of the RTM. My name is Mike Wetzek, and I am a member from District 11. I want to make several points about the proposed retirement incentive plan, all of which revolve around our need to be careful about this decision. First, the cost numbers are big. The EFI actuarial consulting report shows a present value cost to the pension plan of $6.6 .6 million in what was described as scenario two, which assumes that we see normal retirements through September 1st, plus uh, uh, the incentivized retirements. In order for this to make sense for the town, our savings need to be at least a present value of $6.6 .6 million. If we don't achieve savings of at least that much, then in effect we're just deferring the cost into the pension plan, and we heard from Mr. Walco how severely underfunded our pension plan already is. So we should be careful about that. Second, we really do not have enough information about the expected savings to make an informed decision in favor of this incentive. Third, we really should not rush to approve a plan whose costs and benefits we do not fully understand. Think about it. It would be a terrible outcome if we ended up with both higher costs and fewer employees to provide town services. The worst of both possible worlds. Fourth, I want to walk you through a simple example to make this more tangible. Please bear with me. And I'll try to make it short and easy to follow. But I will throw out some numbers. Uh, some of you, many of you, I hope, saw the a uh, simple spreadsheet model that I circulated to the uh, uh, committee and district chairs uh, today. But if not, um, this is a, a simplified version of, of, of that. Suppose we have an eligible employee making $75,000, so eligible for the enhanced pension benefit. He's worked for the town for 35, 36 years. He'll probably retire in any event in a few years, let's say three. Let's also assume that when he retires, um, only every other one of these guys will be replaced. Um, we've heard from um, other uh, committees that the intention is to replace as few as possible. Finally, let's assume that our new employee is paid only half of the salary or wage um, of the retiring employee. That was 75,000, half of that's about 38,000. And because we're only replacing half of those guys, um, then the replacement cost is really only 19. So one 75,000 guy retires, we replace 
every other one of them at half the price. Um, the net cost per retiree employee then is 19,000. So now we're, we're almost in a position to compare the pension and town budget effects with and without the retirement incentive. So first let's look at the pension comparison. Under the current pension plan, the retiree receives a pension of 66.666%, two thirds or $50,000, okay? Under the proposed enhancement, the same retiree would receive uh, almost $55,000, 54,500, but let's use round numbers. In order to get that, he has to retire by September 1st. So uh, by definition, if he retires now, his pension starts now. So the pension plan under the enhancement will pay out $55,000 more for the first three years and about $5,000 more for the rest of that retiree's life. I think you can see why the actuaries have uh, estimated the cost of the enhancement at several million dollars. Of course, we have to consider the savings. And we haven't heard very much about exactly what those are, but let's try this out. So what are the savings potentially to the town's operating budget? If an eligible retiree takes the incentive and retires now, the town saves his $75,000 for three years and incurs only $19,000 in replacement costs in each of those three years. So the savings is $75,000 minus $19,000 or $56,000 for three years. But there's no savings after that because we're expecting the retiree is probably gonna retire in three years anyway. So after that, we've replaced the retiree at the 19,000, you know, half of the retirees at a cost per retiree of 19,000. So we save 75,000, uh, 56,000 for three years. So now let's compare the pension costs and the budget savings. For the first three years, the town has a net savings of $1,000. Operating budget savings of $56,000 per head and an increased pension cost of $55,000 per head. So we save $1,000 for three years. Beyond three years, the operating budget savings is zero, but the pension costs are nearly $5,000 higher per year for the lifetime of the retiree. I think you can see that the increased pension costs quickly overwhelm the modest cost, uh, the modest operating budget savings seen in the first three years. Now you can play with these assumptions. You can say, well, okay, maybe it'll cost us less than 50% um, uh, of the 75,000, or maybe we won't replace even half of them. But these reductions have to be permanent. They can't just be for a couple of years. If we say we're not gonna replace any of these guys, say, and then maybe we're getting close to break even, we have to be committed to the idea that we're never gonna replace them. Because if we replace them in three years, four years, five years, 10 years, we get the cost right back. Uh, but we've already, uh, we get the saving, we lose the savings. So in the model I prepared and circulated to many of you, I assumed a 30 year retirement. A couple of people have pointed out, including Mr. Kava, that many of these retirees will live less than 30 years. Good point. So let's assume 20 years. The magnitude of the cost is lower, but it's still a net cost. Others have pointed out that the savings on medical benefit costs will produce additional savings. Uh, late this afternoon, Mr. Kava sent me some uh, numbers on the uh, medical uh, benefit costs. I've tested that in a, a way consistent with these other um, scenarios that I've tested, and I still get a net cost to the pension enhancement. My analysis of the medical cost information alone by itself uh, suggests that the medical uh, credit part of the program probably has merit, although I think it would be useful to have more time 
uh, to study that. But I don't see that the pension enhancement results in net savings to the town under any reasonable or realistic scenarios. So bottom line, I recommend that the RTM reject item six as presented. I'd personally be willing to reconsider at a later date if um, more comprehensive and compelling information were presented, but based on the information provided to date, I believe it would be an unsound financial decision for the town to adopt the pension uh, benefit enhancement um, being proposed tonight. Thank you. Further discussion on item six? Mr. Pruner, District 10. I agree with many of the things that Mr. Mosesi said, but I also think that there are some solutions that uh, he didn't look at, and I'd like to explain why I think the vote on this should be yes. Let's look at the uh, pension plan as Mr. Tessie and Mr. Walco uh, talked about earlier today. Steve said third quarter of 07, we had $361 million in our pension fund. January 31st, we had only $245 million, a decrease of $117 million. That, on that date, the Dow was around 8,000. As of February 28th, the Dow was down to 6,600. That means that if you use the same ratios, and it's a very complicated investment portfolio, but that potentially is another $45 million in revenues that we've lost. The figures that uh, Steve quoted were $6.6 .6 million for our 8-9 budget that we need to contribute. 9-10 budget is 7.2 million, and he's estimating an additional 10 million for 10 and 11. Um, I'm assuming that that's based on the January 31st figures, so that figure is likely to be higher. As Mr. Wasesky pointed out, we've got a complicated situation here. We will, by passing this tonight, increase the pension payouts. But I think, we do a, I think we do a couple of things that are positive for the town. One is we've got a workforce that needs to be restructured. Some of it's, some of it's been done, it's, it's been painful by, ex, by allowing people, and these are the most senior people, as, uh, as was being discussed, with the highest salaries to retire early, we allow the selectmen and the department heads to restructure their departments in the most effective manner. But what we really need to do is address this issue of the pension. And the one place that I think that we need to look at is a dynamic approach. If we take the money that we would save in the salaries and put it into the pension, and if we take other savings, such as the money we might get back from the auditorium, put that, put that into the pension now, and we That's go... That's just a segue into what's coming later. <laughs> oh, you notice that, okay. Anyway, if we take money from whatever source, and put it into the pension now at 6,600. Even if the Dow only recovers to 9,000, that's 40% that we've that we've earned on that money in I think what is hopefully a very short period of time. So I'm recommending for the fact that I think the town departments will be better off with this and for the fact that if we take these savings and reinvest them into the pension, that you do vote for this. Thank you. For, <clears throat> further discussion on item six? Mr. Von Keiseling, District 8, to be followed by Mr. Boutel. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I urge you to support this resolution before us. Uh, excuse me. 
there are a number of assumptions. Uh, with the, there's an assumption that half of the, plate, uh, the positions that would be uh, left vacant by uh, retirement would, be replaced, would not be replaced. We've heard about how it works with the bumping in our contracts. Seniority is how this thing works. The, the senior employees, by the natural uh, progression of things, rise to the highest level within their field of the union jurisdiction. So what you would be empty when they retire, they'd be emptying a top job, which would be filled by the next seniority. And as it goes down the line, you're more likely to uh, empty a lower, much lower position that would become vacant, whether you stop it or not. To, to and since these are top key administrative positions, it's very unlikely that we would be able to eliminate our top key uh, situations. Uh, I would suggest to you, however that probably the total cost of this resolution is going to be small because it seems that not that large an amount of employees are going to take advantage of this offer no matter how wonderful it is. Perhaps it's more important for us to look at this resolution before us as a statement of policy of the town. Um, the town benefit uh, structure change the, the uh, base to the employees, the base in which we benefit our employees. Uh, we're changing to an employee participation, and we're making a strong statement in that in this resolution about that, that we're changing our times, our ways, and organization. It's a message to the unions as well uh, as we go forward into several very important negotiations that are coming up uh, that you're aware of. Uh, one is that the economic climate is serious and that the packages um, and the table on, of organization in the town must change accordingly. That's, we don't have a choice. We must deal with that. Uh, and, but by doing it this way, we're saying that our town employees are valued and the town is willing to work uh, for mutual benefit in good faith. Uh, and we've heard a lot about the problems that have come without that. I would also put as a postscript that it would probably be, if I were an employee in this position, I'd be wise to grab the deal now and retire with a nice party and a gold watch. Next year is going to be far more severe than the year we're contemplating, and those jobs may be disappear up from the, under them anyhow without any of these benefits. So I would support this. Thank you. Mr. Boutel to be followed by Josie Ann Parnell, District 4. Mr. Moderator, fellow members, uh, one of the roles I play here is I'm one of the five uh, full members of the Labor Contracts Committee. When we went through this, we didn't just sort of float numbers in the air. We talked about specific people in specific positions who would be eligible for these retirements. And I want to stress based on, I, I was part of the emails that got sent around sort of kicking numbers around, but I don't think we can focus on just numbers. I know we're facing tough economic times, but so are the town employees. And I think we need to, to keep in mind that, that these are people who are going to be retiring, some of them retiring before uh, being fully eligible for Social Security and, and Medicare. Um, there's not jobs out there really for them to move into. Uh, I think we're, we're, we're sending a message versus the last round of layoffs um, that we do care about our town employees. Um, and I hope that that's what, what the bargaining units hear. Um, I hope they don't think we're just callous, crunching numbers, and, and not caring about the employees. I think that is the main motivation behind offering this package. We could very easily not offer the package and simply go through another round of cuts. But the nice thing here is, is if you get one relatively senior employee to take the retirement, the bumping happens both ways, unfortunately. If you have a senior position that that opens up, people are going to bump up the food chain as well. And I can think of specific positions that were discussed where you will have to promote, hopefully from within, uh, to fill some of the needed jobs. But this is the one way that, that we make sure that it's not just the people, the last in, first out. Because keep in mind, it's the last in, first out in these four bargaining units that we're talking about who are the people who went into the defined contribution plan rather than the defined benefit plan, which in the last round of negotiations was the number one goal. Um, so just, I, I hope you'll support this, um, but I hope you'll, you'll realize that those who are taking retirement at regular retirement age, this, this is a nice golden handshake. But for those who, who are not yet at full retirement age, you know, they're making a sacrifice giving up a job in this economy. Um, so. As I said, the, the message I'd like to send to the bargaining units is 
uh, we, we recognize and, and we're willing to, to share. Thank you. All right, you're going to have to come forward. Josiane Parnell, District 4. Of these positions that are coming up on presumably um, terminating their services with the town, are there vacation pay and sick pay that would be owed these people? That And what are those amounts? I've, I haven't heard anybody say what that is in addition to what these numbers are that uh, we have been given. Thank you. Mr. Cava. Well, employees would be retiring, not terminating, and under the terms of their collective bargaining agreement, an employee that retires would get paid off any unused vacation or un unused sick leave they may have. So that would be a cost that we would incur at this point in time. Um, so I think that answers the question there. We don't have, we, we do know uh, generally of those employees who are eligible what those sick leave balances are um, and um, what the approximate cost may be. Um, so that has been taken into consideration when we analyze the uh, incentive. I'll just add a couple of, if I may address a couple of points. Um, just in the EFI cost analysis that was um, submitted with the, uh, with the call, just keep in mind there, there are two components in that. One component is a retirement cost. The second component is an OPEP cost, and then the actuary totals them up. So when referring, if you want to split out retirement versus OPEP, there are two separate numbers in that document. Um, and I just point out, too, that this is um, one proposal uh, that we've discussed with the unions, not separate proposals on retirement and health care, so they go together. And it's something that we worked with um, the Selectman's Office and the Board of Estimate, and we analyzed the cost benefit to this, and we think that um, as these employees retire, and we do think we're not going to get you know, and employees to rush out the door accepting this. We think we're actually in this economy, we're gonna have a fairly low number, but to the extent that we can work with our employees and our employee organizations to get to employees to voluntarily leave and retire, rather than go through more layoffs, which very well may happen in any event, um, it's, it's, it's the, a better way to handle it. Keeping in mind that we are currently in negotiations with all of our collective bargaining units for other concessions as well. And this is just one part of an overall package that we're looking at. So I'll just end it there. Thank you. Further discussion on item six. Will the district chairs please mark your voting cards, item number six, and proceed to poll your delegation. No? No, this is a, a straight majority vote. There is no special requirement. There's no charter amendment involved. If you are in favor of offering this incentive program, you should vote yes. If you are opposed, you should vote no. And a simple majority is enough to carry. All right, <clears throat> that concludes our agenda items. But as you know, we do have uh, groups that would like to present items not on our agenda to us tonight. So let me just once again review the procedure. Pursuant to freedom of, of information, we cannot consider a non-agenda item tonight unless we first vote by a two-thirds majority of those present and voting to take up such a non-agenda item. Uh, the first matter that we will take up is a resolution proposed by our land use committee. Um, and I remind everyone that that first procedural vote is non-debatable. So the uh, proponent of the motion to take up the non-agenda item is permitted to read 
the proposed resolution, but uh, there will be no further discussion until we have first agreed to take it up. Franklin Bloomer, Chairman of our Land Use Committee. Mr. Moderator, fellow members of town meeting, uh, on behalf of the Land Use Committee, uh, I Mr. Mr. Bloomer, I'm sorry. Um, there was one procedural announcement that w I neglected to take up. I will get to you uh, in a moment. At this point, I recognize Diane Fox, our town planner, who wanted to make an announcement on behalf of Planning and Zoning Commission. Good evening, Mr. Moderator, RTM members, and guests. I'm here representing the Planning and Zoning Commission in regarding the response of the Planning and Zoning Commissions to District 11's proposal as follows. The Planning and Zoning Commission thanks and accepts District 11 proposal, which suggested that the Planning and Zoning Commission reopen the public hearing on the 119-2009 Visions and Policies Plan of Conservation and Development. We would at future meetings welcome comments and submissions by the public so that the Commission may review and revise, if appropriate, the POCD. The Commission is thinking of holding more than one meeting. One meeting would be to hear questions and comments. The Commission would be giving careful review to those. And the second hearing would be to announce any changes to the plan of conservation and development, if appropriate. At that point, uh, the, the Commission would welcome comments also in terms of written comments at those meetings. We look forward to submitting the final plan of conservation and development after those public hearings for the June 8th RTM meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Bloomer. Uh, on behalf of the Land Use Committee, uh, I move to suspend the rules in order to take up the following resolution. And this is the same as the resolution which has been distributed uh, this evening. You should have it. Uh, the resolution reads as follows. Whereas section 92 of the town charter requires the Planning and Zoning Commission, the Commission, to prepare and adopt a plan of conservation and development, the POCD, and section 96 provides that the POCD shall take effect upon approval by the RTM, and whereas the Commission prepared and immediately following its January 3, 2009 public hearing, adopted a document entitled Vision and Policies, 119 2009, the 119 version, which in a revised form it placed upon and then withdrew from the March RTM call. And whereas many members of the RTM and the broader community have expressed concerns that the 119 version is unsatisfactory and would like it to be revised. And whereas it is desirable that the development of the POCD be a cooperative effort of the Commission and other governmental and non-governmental agencies responsible for its preparation, approval, and implementation. Now therefore be it resolved that the RTM directs its Land Use Committee, the Committee, to one, study the 119 version and its related record, two, receive comments and suggestions from other RTM committees and the public, Three, identify areas of the 119 version and its related record that the committee recommends be changed or supplemented in order to align the 119 version with the views of the broader community. Four, express such recommendations in a format that would permit them to be voted upon separately. And five, report such recommendations to the RTM in such format by its June 2009 meeting and offer a resolution incorporating such recommendations for vote by the RTM, which, if adopted, shall be referred to the Commission for its consideration. All right, that being a motion to uh, offered on behalf of one of our committees. Again, this is a motion. Yes, Mr. Levine. Yes, it is. All right, Mr. Levine, uh, I'm going to call for the vote. There is no debate on this, and um, what I'm hearing you suggest is. Yes, it is. The, the, there was a, I don't know, point of information. We'll treat it as a point of order that because there were people at the door who were discussing this item that it's not appropriate to proceed. Uh, I will rule that that point of order is not well taken. I will now call for a vote. This is 
on a motion to take up a non-agenda item. It requires a two-thirds majority vote under our Freedom of Information Act. Uh, and I'm going to call for a record vote on this. So will the district chairs please mark your voting cards. Land Use Committee motion to take up non-agenda item. If you want to debate this and vote on it tonight, you should vote yes. If you are opposed to uh, taking this up at this time, you should vote no. So uh, please, we will need to suspend the business of the meeting until we have the results of this vote. So I ask that the district chairs please expedite the voting process. Results of the vote on item six, which was the retirement incentive program. Those in favor, 115. Opposed, 66. Abstaining, nine. That item is carried. A, a question has arisen, just if there is any doubt, um, the c calculation of the two-thirds majority required will be based on the voting cards that are presented. Um, it'll be those who actually vote yes or no. Abstentions will be treated as no votes and not counted in the two-thirds calculation.
We have the result of the vote on the Land Use Committee motion to take up a non-agenda item. Those in favor, 80. Opposed, 102. Abstaining, 1. That item has failed. All right. <clears throat> District 1 has a uh, motion. Who is presenting that? Dean Goss, Chairman of District 1. Tom, do we have to preface it with the uh, suspending the rules? Well, you're, you're making a motion to take up the non Oh, okay. Uh, on behalf of District 1, we'd like to present a motion to suspend the rules for to allow the presentation of the following resolution. Uh, whereas a District 1 delegation of the RTM is greatly concerned over the economy and the financial impact on the tra taxpayers' residents in the budget of Greenwich, and whereas the town of Greenwich has taken steps to reduce costs which have included sharp reductions in capital budget and the layoff of town employees, and whereas the town must continue to maximize savings wherever possible to by providing funding only for essential needs, and whereas the building committee for the high school auditorium project has not yet signed contract for the first stages of the project for which funds of some two and a half million dollars have been appropriated, and whereas the current economic situation makes it highly unlikely that the town can afford to spend $25 million to go forward with this project in any of the next several years making any, any engineering and architectural plans developed at this point outdated. Now therefore be it resolved that the representative town meeting strongly encourages the building committee to participate in the efforts to save the Greenwich taxpayers funds by not moving forward with the signing of the contracts and returning all spent funds to the town general fund. And be it further resolved that the representative town meeting strongly encourages the Board of Education, the Board of Estimate and Taxation, and the Board of Selectmen to support this resolution by encouraging the building committee to suspend the project and return excess funds to the town. All right. That being offered on behalf of one of our districts does not require a second. This is again a motion to take up a non-agenda item as just reported by Mr. Goss. Um, now, we, we can um, take votes on procedural issues uh, by voice vote, and I would suggest we try that first, and if there's a need to then proceed to a record vote, we could do that. So, um, all right, we'll take a record vote. Will the district chairs please mark your voting cards? District 1, motion to take up non-agenda item. If you want to debate this tonight, you should vote yes. If not, you vote no. And again, we will await the results of that vote before proceeding further. I have the result of the District 1 motion to take up a non-agenda item. Those in favor, 87. Opposed, 89. Abstaining, 3. That motion has failed. There being no further business to come before us tonight, and absent objection, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for coming. Have a safe trip home.